Good day, everyone, and welcome to Festival 24. My name is Anne Stevens, Vice President of the AES, and I'd like to welcome you, one and all. In so doing, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet today, to elders past and present, and I extend that respect to all Indigenous people who are present today. I'm proud to be part of an organisation that values the rich contribution to Australian life made by Australian First Nations people. And this extends to AES and to the evaluation profession. AES recognises the strong learning demand from our members to discuss, explore and learn practical applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the evaluation profession. In today's rapidly evolving landscape, embracing AI and machine learning technologies is imperative for staying ahead of the curve and ensuring accurate, efficient and insightful evaluations. Over the next three days, we have a program that will support members with introductions to AI and machine learning, the basics, terminologies, technologies, popular programs. AI in evaluation, it's promise and what's possible. Evaluators testing and experimentation with AI and time for ethical considerations. We hope you'll come away with something new something thoughtful, something to apply, and a better understanding of the risks and our responsibilities. Festival 24 is possible because of the work of a dedicated and creative team of AES member volunteers. On behalf of the AES, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to each member of the Festival 24 working group. Your time and commitment have been invaluable in bringing this event to life. Your collaborative spirit and ability to work seamlessly as a team have been the driving force behind the excitement and popularity of Festival 24. And a big thank you to the speakers and contributors who bring their skills, expertise and enthusiasm to this event. We have an excellent lineup both AES members as well as very special international guests. And to everyone online, thank you for registering. Enjoy Festival 24. And so now I'll hand over to Stephanie who will introduce the first session. Thanks Anne for that lovely welcome. And hi everyone, welcome to Festival. Um, today we've got a couple of really great sessions um, to really set the scene for the rest of the rest of the week around um, some basic introductions to AI and how we might use AI in evaluation. I know I'm looking forward to learning much more than I already know about, uh, which isn't much, about AI in evaluation. So it should be an excellent three days. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Christy Hornby, Hornby who's going to take us through an AI 101. Uh, Christy is an experienced evaluator and has a keen interest in new technology, particularly AI. So Christy, I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much, Steph, and th thanks, Anne, as well. Um, while I'm just getting my uh, presentation pack up, I just really wanted to echo Anne's comments around the AES uh, community of volunteers. So I do find that this is a really passionate um, community where we can all sort of come together and share our love and knowledge of research and evaluation. And there's many, many smart people out there making events like this possible. So thank you. On to today. Very, very excited to, to be here and opening festival for you. I hope you come away with some of my passion for and interest in evaluation. I've done similar talks before and I've been really heartened to see that people have then gone on to do further investigation of AI and build their capability and confidence with it as a result. So I'd love if that can be, be the same for you. So I'll be talking through AI 101 for evaluators. So don't worry, there's no preconceived knowledge that's required here. This is all to set you up for a great three days and to enjoy the rest of the festival with some you know, mental models in place for how it all works. Before I get into the, the presentation itself, I too would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we work, live and play. So I'm joining from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, particularly in this week being National Re Reconcil Reconciliation Week. 
Over to you. So this is a little bit unusual where I'm going to be getting you to be doing some talking by way of responding to a poll for me rather than me starting off talking. So I'll be using a website called Slido, S-L-I.D-O, to, to do some polling, two short polls and to manage the audience Q&As today. So if you're able to, please go open in your web browser or on your browser on your mobile phone and go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code 1891230. There's also the QR code there where if you want to bring up your phone camera, hovering over that will take you straight through to the Slido website and this event um, if you're, you're camera savvy and have it out. I'll keep the details on each slide, so don't, don't get fear of missing out. They'll be available down the bottom left of each slide so that if you've missed it now, you can pop in at any time. There'll be two polls. So poll one will be open now and poll two will be open in about 10 minutes time. Poll one is how would you rate your confidence to use AI today? So there's just a simple five, five level um, Leichhardt scale there. And then poll two is how would you rate your capability to use AI today? Again, just a, a five point like art scale there. Um, you know, being evaluators, we'd ask, well, what do you mean by confidence and capability and AI and how would you define these terms? I'm not going to be writing a paper on this. So I'm just really keen to get a pulse check of how we as a community, the community attending festival feel about this. And then I'll present the results of the two polls at the end of um, my presentation. Steph will kindly open poll two for me in about 10 minutes time, and she'll also post in the chat when that's open if you want to participate. In addition to the participating in the polls, if you, you'd like to cast your vote on, on those points, um, feel free to ask questions through Slido at any time. So if you haven't used Slido before, it's got a thumbs up uh, rating system where if someone asks a question and you really like that question, you can give it a thumbs up. And then the questions that have the most thumbs up at the end of the session will be the ones that I answer. So it's a really lovely way to democratise the sort of Q&A process and to make sure that the questions that are most of interest to today's audience get, get asked and answered. I'll respond to any questions that weren't answered um, out of session as well. All right. So what are we doing today? So um, as I alluded to, this is AI 101 for evaluators. No prior knowledge or experience is required. You're perfectly fine here exactly as you are. I know, uh, you know, I've been through this process. Others have been through this process. AI, artificial intelligence can be a bit scary, can be a bit daunting. It can also be really technocratic. So there's a lot of technical terms. There's a lot of acronyms and abbreviations for sure. And it can feel hard to get your feet in, in this domain. But it is, a, it is a domain that's becoming increasingly important. And so it's really important that we all do grapple with it and have some base level of understanding of what is AI and some key concepts relating to it. So that's really the purpose of this session. I'd love to, by the end of it, have built that foundational level of capability so that you can you know, have the capability, have the confidence to go off after this and to do some more research and experimentation and not feel so daunted when the time inevitably comes for you to evaluate a program that has an AI-enabled component. So my jokey tagline is, let's get you today from AI 101 to 102. We love our definitions. So what is AI? It's a broad term. It's thrown around a lot. Um, it can mean different things to different people. There are literally a million definitions out there by now. The definition I've chosen to go with today for, for today's audience is the, the working definition of AI, artificial intelligence, that's been developed by the OECD. So cleverly, it separates the definition into the, the two phases of, of AI, artificial intelligence. So one phase is when you're building the AI machine and so you're creating it, but it's not yet live. It hasn't been developed and it hasn't been implemented. So that's the build phase. So OECD's definition there is that it's an AI system that's a machine-based system that for explicit or implicit objectives infers from the input it receives how to generate outputs such as predictions, content recommendations or decisions. So all you're looking at in the build phase is that AI has, um, has a set process for how to generate outputs. So it could be something like you're building the, the world's greatest rival to chat GPT. So you, you've then got your, your sense, you've got your structure, your model set up, and your training data in for how those outputs will be generated. 
But for us as evaluators, we're going to be mostly more interested in the use phase um, definition, which will be 99% of the time the type of AI that we encounter, which is AI that's already been implemented, that's live, that that's the, the kind of AI that we're engaging with directly or perhaps evaluating. So the OECD's definition here is for the use phase once the model is built. It's an AI system that's a machine-based system that for explicit or implicit objectives infers from the input it receives how to generate outputs such as predictions, content, recommendations or decisions that can influence physical or virtual environments. And it notes different AI systems can vary in their levels of autonomy and adaptiveness after deployment. So this one really talks to the, I guess, the, the beautiful diversity of AI that we see out there which is also the cause of some of the confusion. AI can mean a chat GPT, a Claude, a Bard. It can also mean a Fireflies or a Copilot. It can also mean a Wally or, or, or a, a, sorry, a Dali uh, creating images. You know, AI is this really all-encompassing term. Um, so that that definition is quite broad. We'll unpick some of the the you know specific terminology in a second. But first, I want to start with the why should you care? You know, why, why is this relevant to the world right now? And why should you engage with AI or at least bother to build your base knowledge of it right now? So I like to keep it simple, the rule of three. So firstly, we've found that there's at least 275 AI and automated decision tools in the New South Wales public sector. So if we do some rudimentary arithmetic, and multiply that across Australian states and territories, there could be close to 2,000 across state and territory governments alone. That's not counting federal or local government bodies or for-purpose organisations or private entities. So that is a lot of AI and automated decision-making tools out there. Um, from that point to almost every organisation in the country is asking what AI means for them. So what does it mean for their strategy? What does it mean for their competitors? What does it mean for their service offering? What does it mean for their workforce? There are a lot of implications for it from this technology. And thinking about the broadness of that, that definition AI, they're generally thinking about it more in terms of the generative um, AI, which had that real breakthrough with ChatGPT's public release at the back end of 2022. Um, but even prior to that, insurance, health, recruitment fields, They'd all used AI for a long time. Um, and so there's this increasing pressure across every organisation to do more with less. And AI and automated decision making is part of that equation. Thirdly, because of all this, new solutions, new applications are being introduced and evolving at an exponential rate. The capability of the technology is doubling every few months. Um, so the, the timeline, the, the rapidity of change is like nothing we've ever seen before in our lifetimes. As a result, so too then are the jobs and skills that are required to develop, implement, maintain and improve these AI programs and systems, as well as the actual programs and services that are supported or delivered by them, while at the same time traditional roles are under threat. So you can see um, in the bottom right there, this is just a bit of a mock-up of some of the, the skills, um, you know, the skill transition that we're, we're seeing right now and we're going to see more of. So capabilities, you know, Currently and in the past, we might have praised manual transaction speed or reporting accuracy or descriptive and diagnostic reviews or strategic planning. But in the future, it's probably more about complex problem solving, data science. You know, we've seen that in the explosion of big data and, and the role of data scientists and all, all the um, related fields around that. User experience design, advanced analytics, scenario-led co-design and so on and so forth across sort of skills, moving from waterfall methods to agile techniques, um, more sort of ability to cope with ambiguity and to, and to manage VUCA context, so contexts that are volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, and to have uh, different aptitudes in our um, workforce and population as a result. So, you know, not having a fear, fear of failure, welcoming experimentation and being open and adaptable to change rather than perhaps being process-driven. So these are some of the changes we're seeing now in our workforces and into the future as a result of this technolo technological revolution. Some common terminology and concepts. So I know this is a really busy slide. Um, I will be providing my slides um, you know, available after this. So this is really, if you can imagine, 
I'll whiz through it for the purpose of today's session, but then there's sort of a handy collection here that you can go back and research further in the future if there's anything you don't understand. I've tried to group the concepts um, together so that they make sense in, in different conceptual buckets. So I'll start at the top, top left hand and then I'll work my way across to the right. So AI we've talked about. So it's a machine-based system that uses explicit or, or implicit objectives to infer certain um, outcomes or, or predictions, and it can have an influence on the physical or the virtual environment. AI and automated decision-making ADM are very close cousins. So both are complex machines that, as, as the result of a model, a computer model being developed, produce outputs that process information, you know, faster than the human brain can, faster than technology ha has been up to date. The generally accepted distinction between the two is that AI often doesn't have a black box to explain the output it puts that it produces. So it might produce recommendation A, recommendation B, and you sort of don't know with an AI model how that's come to be. With an ADM or automated decision made a a decision making model, you can trace back the decision into the black box. So you can say, ah, recommendation A was made because that candidate passed X and Y checks but didn't pass Z checks. So we've got that recommendation. Or, you know, recommendation B, you know, that person's visa was accepted compared to that person because they passed this criteria as opposed to that. So they sort of operate in a very similar way, but that's the general distinction that's applied between the two. Where, you know, where the world's gotten really excited lately in the last few years is the generative AI. And it really did happen with ChatGPT's launch where we'd sort of been almost, you know, a bit slumbering, if if you will uh, accept the analogy. We've been sort of a bit, a bit sort of, you know, quite comfortable with the way the world was going. These big companies, these privately owned companies, these technology companies were working on all these developments all the time. But it was really the introduction of introduction of ChatGPT into the public domain. And everyone, regardless of economic status, employment, language, background, being um, able to engage with it all at once really made the, those, um, you know, radar pop up and say, you know, what's happening? This is a, a really big disruption in our lifetime. So generative AI, it's sort of implicit in the name. It's AI that's able to generate something from the input that you provide it. This is sort of a, a step on the pathway to what's called AGI, artificial general intelligence. So AGI is theorized at when, you know, the, syn the synchronicity might, might happen, um, you know, when, hu when technology sort of surpasses or mimics the human brain and human cap capability. Uh, the singularity, sorry, instead of syn synchronicity. So it's estimated that we're still some time away away from that, um, but this is sort of seen as, you know, a big leap that's propelled us towards that concept. Where we've come from in the past, though, we've had, as I mentioned, AI around for a long time, you know, since the 70s, 80s, pro probably even beyond traditionally in, you know, banking and, and healthcare and um, insurance, recruitment, all those different algorithms that say, you know, we recommend this candidate for this job or this person qualifies for this level of health insurance or this type of mortgage. So those can be sort of thought of as reactive machines. So, you know, they have no memory of the past. You put in a, a bunch of data and it spits out a recommendation or an output, you know, application accepted, application denied. Um, so very, very specific machines for a specific purpose. Limited memory machines can use inference from other, um, you know, things in the environment around it or other things that have happened in the past. Um, so they're a bit more sophisticated, but they're still not as close as, ge ge uh, as generative AI is at the moment, which can really piece together knowledge and, you know, insights from lots and lots of different information sources very quickly. Theory of mind is sort of where the generative AI is starting to go. Um, so there's some really cool YouTube videos available if anyone's keen. Look at the Boston Dynamics work with OpenAI. So they've actually implemented OpenAI um, in a, a robot sort of body and it's able to react to situations much like a human would. So we're starting to see that theory of mind where androids can recognise and, and process emotions and react to live stimuli around them. We're starting to see that happen. Down the bottom right then, 
there's a few different types um, of, of AI again, or just a few different key concepts to understand how it works. So LLMs, large language models, that's your chat GPT, your, your BARD, your Claude, et cetera. Um, so these work on written text and written language, and they'll provide the, the output as a result. People are often less aware of MFMs, so multimodal foundation models. Try saying that one fast. Um, but this is your sort of your, your DALI, your audio processing, your, your video processing. So these can create images or songs or, or videos or other types of media that's not just the written word for you. Um, so I'll give you a summary of some of those in a sec. Machine learning is the, the way in which these machines, these programs are trained and developed. So it sort of says it in the name, it, it's learning. So the machine is fed a, a whole set of training data that's hopefully relevant. Um, and it's sort of trained on that, that, um, that data and refined with human input to get as accurate as possible. It's able to then sort of spit out very specific um, responses to very specific training data. So think of that as quite narrow. Deep learning builds on machine learning where its output can be more varied and it can consider more, um, more uh, inputs as a result. So think of machine learning as like a tool that's used for one specific thing. So it's used to scan candidate CVs or it's used to um, you know, predict who, who might be a security threat or, or something like that. It gets very, very good at one specific thing. Deep learning can take the inputs from a couple of different things to then provide greater and more insightful information. So if you've seen those funny um, images of, you know, is it a chihuahua or is it a chocolate chip cupcake? That's examples of deep learning that's sort of looking at a whole bunch of images and trying to code them as a chihuahua or a chocolate chip, chocolate chip um, cupcake. Neural network is really the model that's set up to enable these programs to sort of think and um, you know be like the human brain. There's a few different types of sophistication there, but the most common one is ANN, an artificial neural network that sort of mimics having nodes in, in the brain that are sort of uh, centers for, for the machine to grab onto. And then reinforcement learning is that process I alluded to earlier where the human sort of comes in and reinforces what are good outcomes and, and rewards the machine by, by saying that's fine and tries to weed out bad outcomes or biases by tweaking the training data to make sure that it's reflective. The, over to the, the middle column on the bottom, natural language processing. Oh, that's just a fancy way for saying that the machine can read written text and, and respond to it or, or even auditory text these days actually, so spoken word. Um, and same with NLG, natural language generation, so that they can actually generate those responses or you can have that conversation with them like Siri or, or Alexa and similar technology. Last but not least, on, on the bottom right-hand side are three sort of key concepts to be aware of when you're engaging with these AI um, tools and solutions. So prompt engineering, you might have seen a whole bunch of um, material about it. It's a whole industry in and of itself now. So prompt engineering just refers to your ability to make a machine give you what you want by being really targeted and really clear in the kind of output that you're asking for. So you might ask for responses as a consultant, as a public sector worker, as a minister. And so you sort of prompt the machine to consider specific things, you know, in particular in its response to you. Hallucination refers to that risk of the AI machines presenting very confidently inaccurate information. So that AI can hallucinate, it can think its facts are correct when they're in fact not. Um, so there's an emerging discipline as well around how to manage hallucinations and how to sort of weed them out of AI uh, programs and solutions. And finally, temperature, that refers to in some solutions, you can tweak the temperature, you can make it more, more fine-tuned to error or less fine-tuned to error. So that can just help increase the sensitivity of the machine to your query to producing the right outcome. So again, I know that was a lot. I'm not intending that people sort of take this in and, and are able to go and, and talk about this, um, but really here, here's a list of sort of the key concepts that you might like to dig into more in the future. Conscious of, of time and the needs of this presentation, in terms of where we're at globally, in essence, there's a whole lot of different legislation, regulation and principles-based approaches across um, different jurisdictions. Australia so far is taking a principles-based approach to regulation. 
DISA has done some really great work. Check out their, rep, their rapid response paper. It's amazing. There's a lot of other good guidance there. Um, the main cool thing I like people to be aware of is the European, European Union AI Act outright bans some categories of use of AI. So that one's really important and really useful to be across in that it uses a risk-based threshold for its regulation. Um, an important development this week or last week as well, Australia has also just signed up to the CO Convention for the Responsible Use of AI. So stay tuned for that. I mentioned DISA. CSIRO is another really awesome resource. They've had, they have their National AI Centre where I get a lot of information from with world-class free webinars, so check that out. In terms of solutions, so we tend to think of those text-based solutions as AI, but there's so much more there. So Copilot um, is that sort of a, a annoying but helpful, you know, 20, 2024 version of Clippy, the old um, Microsoft Office um, support, where it'll it'll ask you if you need help through your, your different products. It, it does have more um, functionality than that, but that's probably the main thing that people are aware of for now. Um, DALI's a uh, solution for producing images. I think it can also now do video, but I haven't um, played with it for, for a little while. Um, but DALI can produce amazing um, AI images. And I think the AES actually used it for the logo um, for Festival as well. So there's a very cool contemporary use of it. Otter and I don't know if I have it on here, Fireflies and other ones like that. They can, um, and Microsoft Teams has inbuilt AI as well. They can transcribe your meeting um, minutes and sort of pr produce a reasonably accurate summary, but they can also do that speech to text, text recognition and sort of produce the outputs for you. Um, GitHub, that's one for sort of um, en engineers to play around with. It provides code solutions and Magic Form can help you design different customer service forms or different data capture forms. So. My main takeaway here is a lot of people conflate ChatGPT with AI, but AI is so much so much broader than ChatGPT, so just don't fall into that mental trap there. Some of you might have also seen previous iterations of, of this um, presentation, so I wanted to, you know, for you as well, well as for everyone, include some recent developments and some really cool facts that sort of lit my fire when I became aware of them. So, you know, these are, are all just from the last month, so which again highlights how fast the, this sector is growing and, and how much AI capability is developing. So firstly, in the UK, job postings that require AI skills were growing at 3.6 times relative to all job listings. So my takeaway from that is if you're not on the train now, better get on it so that you don't get left behind. It's, it is the way the world is going. The next one down, 77% of companies in a recent survey report successful generative AI pilots, but 80% cite data privacy and security concerns. 45% of organisations reported unintended data exposure issues in another recent survey. There's a lot of work here for us to do as evaluators to make sure those safeguards are in place, that information's not leaked, that information's not misused. So this is a really important one for us in our field. My colleague, Nick Lisk, who's a cybersecurity expert, will also be talking more about the technical aspects of AI at the 1pm festival session tomorrow, if you'd like to know more. Third one down, analysis shows that ChatGPT produces incorrect answers more than 50% of the time. But the bit that really got me was that users were unaware there was an error in 39% of cases of incorrect answers. So the re reliability of the technology is moving at, at an exponential rate, but you still have to be very, very careful where and how you use it. Fourth one down in the uh, Office for the AI Commission's most recent Community Attitudes to Privacy Survey, 43% of respondents, and this was of the general public, were very concerned about their personal information being used by AI technology, while 71% wanted to be told if AI was being used to handle their personal information. Almost everyone wanted conditions in place before AI was used to make a decision that might affect them. And very reasonable, I might say. So this really gives you a snapshot of community attitudes right now to the use of AI. So again, as evaluators, we need to make sure that consumer expectations and, and you know, legal obligations are obliged when we're coming in to do an evaluation. Finally, the, the fifth point I wanted to make, that sort of unusual looking image da down the, the bottom there, um, ChatGPT uh, for, for Amiga 
um, was recently released as well, and that does include the ability to remember your previous conversations, and it does mean that your answers can be more accurate, but it could also mean that they're less accurate because they're remembering things you've previously told it, and it may make incorrect assumptions on that basis. So the ability to converse with, um, you know, the generative AI and for it to remember your past responses, that's a huge game changer, as is the ability to now use increased, you know, auditory engagement with it. So what does this all mean? This has been a well, whirlwind tour of AI. Pop opportunities and, and risks for AI. So firstly, it democratises knowledge and power for those who may not be traditionally able to access it. There's greater process efficiency, so it can greatly speed up manual or repeat or routine tasks. Um, there's new jobs and skills being created, so that creates new opportunities for us all. And there's knowledge breakthroughs in key areas that we should be really excited about helping with the, the efficacy of cancer diagnosis or medical diagnosis or even just, you know, climate action. There's really, really cool techno technology that's happening and really great breakthroughs that are happening that will benefit us as, as the, the world. The, the main risks to be aware of, privacy and confidentiality breaches being number one. Don't enter anything into the machine that you want to want your boss, your grandma, your high school teacher, et cetera, um, to have access to. Misinformation, disinformation. So because these machines take in everything, they don't yet weight what's true over what's not. So you can't always be sure that you're getting the correct information, as well as there being a sort of war on truth in today's day and age anyway. It can, it can also, um, you know, sadly, heighten discrimination towards marginalised people. So it can increase those systemic disadvantages that we have if training data is not well used. It can cause those job losses and structural change in our societies and really just exacerbate existing risks with, with all of the above. But bringing it right back to us here and bringing it right back to us at Festival, what does this mean for evaluators evaluating AI? So if you're evaluating AI-enabled programs or services, firstly, evaluate at all stages of the program lifecycle. Don't forget the model design, the training data, the testing, implementation, post-implementation. Secondly, evaluate more than usual to understand where the human is in the system and how oversight governance and the avoidance of bias is being managed. Thirdly, determine the impact of that program as you would for any other evaluation, but with a particular focus on the quality of the training and or input data the decision-making process and the input on the human, considering both positive and negative outcomes. Fourth, my big call to action, I'll, end, I'll start to end where I began. This only works if you understand the technology yourself. So you really do need to have a working understanding of AI to maintain your relevance as an evaluator in today's day and age. For those who might look at using AI in, in your own work or, or to supplement your resources, Numbers one, two, and three, be really conscious of the strengths and limitations of the technology you're using to make sure you're using it ethically and appropriately. Bias in training data is a really huge issue, so make sure you're not accidentally perpetuating those issues. And it's your responsibility to educate yourself on the use of AI, just as it was to learn how to you know, develop a program theory or to use data responsibly, et cetera. This is now our job at, at, in our profession. Fourth, then, validate your outputs at least the first few times just to sort of do that comparison check and make sure you are getting accurate out outcomes and mitigate that risk of hallucinations or bias. Five, subscribe to threads or channels um, discussing the solutions you use. Make sure you're aware of any updates or any bugs or issues, and that can help to also provide a further check and balance for you too. But six, give it a go. I'm not a techie myself. I've learned this just all through being really passionate about the field of following the developments and attending various courses and, and seminars and AI and having, having a go evaluating AI-enabled programs in our work at Grosvenor. Give it a go. The technology is still evolving. You know, we're, we're all here to learn this together and share knowledge through you know, forums like the AES. So that's a very quick whiz through, um, you know, AI 101 for evaluators. If you'd like to know more, Grosvenor does have a um, governance and evaluation in AI uh, service offering. So you can check that out at our website there or reach out to myself, my colleague, Nick, who's talking tomorrow or our other colleague, Charity Davies, to learn more. But that's the, the end of, I guess, the formalities. I'm super keen now to see what, um, what the polls are saying. Well, that's the most interesting bit for me anyway. So... We'll jump. 
over to the poll results. So these are your answers from the, oh great, people are still completing it. So this is really lovely. So the response to the poll question on how would you rate your capability to use AI today, close to 40% of the people on the line feel they're about as capable as the average person. So that's really, really wonderful. That's really good that our profession has sort of embraced that change and, and is working to, to adopt it um, in line with the, the general population. Um, next, people feel less capable, either not at all capable or less capable, but not completely incapable. So hopefully there's a few of you on the line that feel like your, your skills have been up, updated a little bit through, through the, that conceptual overview and through the rest of the festival sessions. Moving on to poll number one, your confidence to use AI today um, probably unsurprisingly mirrors the results of the capability poll. Most people saying they're about as confident as the average person, but then the next two responses saying I'm less confident than or I'm not at all confident. Um, so hopefully this has also given you a, a bit of confidence. Um, so that's a really wonderful pulse check on the state of AI ad adoption and, and confidence today. So... I'll jump into the Q and A's. Let me just have a little look how that's gone. Excellent. So the, the first question that um, popped up for, for me is, if you're using AI in your work, what should be declared to your stakeholders in terms of using this tool? Um, I would really treat it the, the way that you would treat anything else. So um, if you were disclosing your information to a third party, an AI is a third party, so you should disclose that you're using an AI in perhaps your transcription or your analysis or your report or output generation. Um, the main implication to my mind is for our profession is the use of AI-enabled technology in supporting consultation and primary data collection activities. So, um, for example, at Grosvenor, currently we two up on consultation. So we'll have two people attend a consultation from our end one to facilitate and lead the session and the other to transcribe the notes from it. And that's to make sure that we balance both the engagement in the room as well as get accurate, accurate data recorded. We're seeing more and more a sort of push from, from clients to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so we've asked the question of ourselves, well, could you use, you know, an AI enabled recording um, software to summarize your stakeholder consultation notes and sort of address that need? We've chosen deliberately not to at the moment, but we can see that that could be one way our profession goes. Um, what you'd have to do then if you know anyone on the line took that up is disclose that that recording is being used. So you'd disclose in, in advance and obtain informed consent. And then you'd also provide them a copy of the transcribed notes as well so that the consultee could perhaps add to or, or change any of their results. But absolutely disclose, um, you know, everything that's being used if you sort of use the reasonable man man test of you know how would this be reported on in the herald sun anything that you wouldn't want reported on in the herald sun you'd make sure to um disclose in advance um the next question down has asked what do you mean by by bias in training data which is so cool i love this stuff um even though it's bad for us i love this stuff so the best example I can think of because it's most relatable to most people is if you think of Seek. So Seek uses um, an algorithm that looks for specific keywords in your application. So if you're applying for a job as an evaluation consultant, if you perhaps had the keywords program, logic, Michael Quinn pattern, um, evaluation and so on in your CV, your CV might go to the top of the recommended pile by Seek's algorithm compared to applicants that don't use those keywords, but may be equally qualified. So there's, I guess, bias in, in the training data where the Seek algorithm says these, these four words or however many words are, are words that indicate a good candidate. So therefore, if candidates use these words, they are a better candidate than others. That's a simple way to um, explain the issue. When I draw out sort of, you know, globally, what does that mean? Or, or at a systems level, what does that mean? That means that marginalised, um, you know, people from marginalised backgrounds have indig indignities and biases perpetuated against them. So again, using the Seek example, 
if SEEK's training data shows that white Anglo-Saxon Saxon men are more likely to, to be awarded jobs that are at 200K or above, surprise, surprise, when the candidates are assessed by the SEEK algorithm, it's going to put white Anglo-Saxon men to the top of the pile for those 200K jobs. So that's the bias inbuilt into the training data where what's happened is can perpetuate the outcome. That's where you need to be really careful about managing that bias in the training data where you're sort of continually looking at, well, actually, were those recommendations correct? Did they last in those jobs? Were they a good fit for those jobs? And go back and sort of seek to change that training data and update it to, you know, really not um, artificially limit people from those opportunities. Oh, interesting. Um, the next question down is someone's asked, can AI take into account ethical considerations? I would say yes and no. So yes, if you directly ask the AI, if you remember to directly ask the AI, it will give you a, a high level overview of um, ethical considerations. You could also, using prompt engineering, which is hopefully a term you're more familiar with now, ask um, the AI to perhaps provide you what are some ethical risks with the query you've put in against the national statement for, um, you know, human research ethics. So you, you can um, receive ethical considerations from AI, but it's sort of on you as the human to prompt it and, and to generate that. Um, on, the, on the other side, uh, sort of another uh, issue which sort of is in the area of bias and ethical considerations with AI is that they're sort of primed to give a positive response. So AI is, um, uh, you know, prompted to give affirmative responses. So you'd rarely get an AI telling you, I don't know the answer to this question. That's just not how they're programmed. You would get the AI telling you an answer, even if it's the incorrect answer. So in that way, it can't really give you ethical considerations. Um, how am I going to put it? Another person has asked, what's the environmental cost or risk of using AI? For example, ChatGPT has a big negative environmental impact because of the data centres to run it. Absolutely. And this is a, a really tricky one. Um, you know, I'd almost say from an environmental, social and, and governance lens rather than just environmental. So these tools are big data tools. They do billions of processes per second. And with the uptake that we're seeing of, you know, almost all of the, the humans on earth engaging with these in some way, shape or form, that's a lot of data being consumed, which means there's a lot of electricity being consumed, which means there's a lot of precious minerals being mined to develop and, and support the, the hardware for, for these. So there's a big environmental footprint here. Sadly, I think the, the horse has bolted on that. So you know, as is commonly the case with new developments, regulators all over the world are scrambling to keep up. And the regulatory focus at the moment is more around sort of the use of AI and its permitted use cases rather than any sort of ESG impact. So, we're, you know, I think it, it'll be way down the track um, where, when that sort of, you know, enters our, our regulators' um, minds. There's also that piece about the the social impact of the, the generative AI as well. And how that's changing our society. So um, I had a conversation with someone a couple of months ago that said their daughter was penalised for using generative AI in an assignment in school. And my first blush is, oh, that's not good, that's cheating. Uh, but then my thought is, hang on, isn't school the place where we prepare young adults to go into the world and, and learn things? So shouldn't, you know, there perhaps be changes in our schooling system to account for this new technology and teach young people how to use it responsibly and ethically and, and accuracy? And accurately. So there's also that piece there. And then, of course, the G for governance, which is what we're big on here. So, you know, this technology is running a million miles an hour. The horse has bolted. It's sort of like the, the cybersecurity revolution of a couple of years ago, where now you're seeing all the big data breaches because boards and organisations weren't prepared for them. It's the same with AI. We're right at this tipping point. So how is your AI governed? Have you even thought about it? Do you have an AI policy in place? Who's using what? You know, what parameters have you, you set in place? What training have you set, set in place? Um, my also tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, I guess throwaway line is if there's parts of our community that can't operate an Excel sp spreadsheet properly, how on earth can we expect them to engage with these complex AI machines and do so responsibly, ethically and accurately? So there really becomes an incumbent upon employers and also us as evaluators, given the privilege we have in our profession, 
to play a part of that educational um, sort of role. Um, next question down, how have you dealt with data security and privacy concerns, particularly offshore data processing? Do you have a closed tool within their enterprise tenant? Um, so for us personally at Grosvenor, we've looked at Copilot, but we haven't implemented anything yet. So Copilot is a Microsoft program that sort of um, becomes part of your operating environment and, and your systems, and it can help you to better organize your knowledge. It can help with those sort of transcriptions functions. It can help with your analysis um, in a sort of closed environment. So it's only attached to your data and can only read your data. But most importantly, it can't put your data back out into, you know, the World Wide Web for other people to, to learn. Um, so my, my colleague, Nick, who I've mentioned a few times, he's sort of led, led that process. And we haven't gone ahead with it at the moment because we're not fully um, comfortable with Microsoft's assurances around how it prevents that data from leaking to the outside world. So we haven't used it at the moment, but we are sort of looking at, you know, what does that mean for our profession? We do know that some of our competitors um, that, that are larger have implemented Copilot and other solutions like that within their environment and have given them free reign to, you know, sort of client files and client data. We don't feel comfortable with that at the moment, but how you manage it is how you manage any sort of, um, you know, security or access control platforms where you'd give sort of, you know, grant different permission levels to different parts of your internal infrastructure and, um, you know, IT architecture, um, giving different levels of access to it. You might also ring fence different components where if there's parts that can never, never be read by the AI, you'd undergo through a, a separate sort of, you know, set up um, to establish that. In terms of offshore data processing, I did want to pick up on that point as well, because that is super, super interesting, um, where we're also seeing a sort of, um, you know, re-sort of nat naturalisation, um, you know, across recent years where, you know, for example, we've used SurveyMonkey as our preferred survey platform for years and years, but now we're increasingly seeing requests from clients to use things like forms or to other, um, you know, solutions that have data hosted in Australia. So we're really seeing those, um, you know, data processing and storage, um, you know, considerations top of mind for clients. And that often sort of moves the industry in different ways as well. So it'll be interesting to see whether some of these bigger platforms end up putting data centers and servers in a number of different locations to maximize their competitiveness you know, with, with that emerging um, consideration. Okay. I'll pass back to Steph in two or three minutes because we're, we're very mindful we need to close on time to, um, you know, be able to set up for, for the next session, which will be wonderful. So I might only sneak in a, a couple of more um, items there. And there's some hot contention um, in the slider, which is always really exciting, at least for a geek like me. Um, so I'll go for the one that's now got um, the highest number of votes. Um, how can AI approach issues of data sovereignty? Who owns data findings when the generative AI is used? That is an excellent question because it is one the legal system is currently trying to determine. Um, so copyright infringement. So generative AI can, um, you know, it is, it has drawn from all the information available on the internet. So in the Australian context, for example, it's drawn from News Corp um, media articles well, who owns the content now then? If you're, is it News Corp? Is it the generative AI that you're accessing it from? Should there be any copyright infringements paid? Should there be any royalties or licensing arrangements paid? If that happens, doesn't the technology become obsolete by the time you negotiate all, all these deals? You know, think of sort of um, music or video streaming rights, but on steroids with every single piece of written content available on the internet. You know, if we go down that model, it ends up becoming unworkable. The other, um, so there are a couple of challenges in, in court at the moment, mostly brought by those media companies um, to, to sort of test that case for, you know, what, what, um, what can they receive for their intellectual property being infringed upon by, by these machines? So we'll be watching those developments. Um, the second point to call out is also this sort of more philosophical question of knowing what we know now, would we wind back the clock? 
Um, so there have been incredible breakthroughs in particularly healthcare and climate action where there's new solutions to these really wicked problems. And in particular, one that really struck me, um, you know, one AI, in a healthcare diagnostic um, program, accessed um, thousands, you know, thousands of, of patients' private medical records and private x-rays and private health data um, to create a diagnostic tool that can now to 90% plus accuracy determine the kind of cancer you have. So it's speeding up detection and it's speeding up prevention. That's just one example that I'm aware of and I'm sure there's many others what then is the value of someone's data, you know, both to that person and then to the society, if as a society we can improve our cancer detection and prevention and therefore recovery rate, you know, where, where do we draw that line? Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions here and that's actually a great opportunity for me to plug the great debate. So we'll be talking about that on Thursday at 12pm as part of Festival. Um, we'll be arguing the the case for and against the benefits of AI in evaluation because there are a lot of philosophical debates ranging right now and, and that's just one of many of them. So that one, is, um, for purposes of timing, is the last question I'll answer um, in this session. So I'll hand back to Steph in a sec. Um, before I close out, I do hope that you've caught a bit of the, the AI bug and that you're you know, coming away with a bit of enthusiasm, a bit more capability, a bit more confidence to go off a, a, and explore and really, you know, make the most of this week. It's an amazing event series that AES and its series of volunteers put together, you know, some of the world's best leaders and thinkers in AI, you know, really giving you the cliff notes all, all at once, um, you know, live and, and recorded um, after the fact as well. So make the most of this, check out the CSIRO National AI Centre as well, which is a really invaluable resource we're privileged to have in Australia. That's all from me. I'm really, really looking forward to the next session. So Kia ora katoa. I think it is exactly 3pm 3, 3 New Zealand time on the dot, 1pm in Australia. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the second session of Festival, Working Smarter, Not Harder with AI. I'm Marini Sanko, the session facilitator, speaking from Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the diverse lands in which we all come from today. In this 50 minute session, featuring 15 minute presentations from Laurie Crawford and David Fetterman, um, we will record and upload this to AES YouTube in about three weeks. I will take any urgent questions directed at each of the speakers shortly after they finish. So please feel free to put them in the chat. We will also have about 15 to 20 minutes to um, discuss any further questions you will have in the quick Q&A session, session right at the end. Um, so I won't take too, too long introducing the speakers. They are quite, quite prolific in their own fields. Um, Laurie is a Wellington-based mixed methods evaluator with a background in psychology who uses the pronouns of they, them. David is a pioneer of the empowerment evaluation approach and has worked globally. Together, they will present their insights on the practical implications of AI to, and their unique insights on it. So without further ado, over to you, Laurie. Kia ora. Oh. Thank you. That was such a kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen. And we can get going. Share screen. Share the correct screen. Go. Uh, so my presentation is called Work Smarter, Not Harder. Um, and it's an evaluator's principles. My principles for thinking about considering how I might potentially use AI in a professional capacity. Um, I'm really, really glad that I am behind Christy in this running order. I think she's kind of given you guys a really nice primer. And what my talk does is that it leads on from previous talks I've done where I've kind of done a bit of an introduction to AI 
as part of my own learning process and, and sharing what I've learned. It, it sounds like Chris, you know, I've been on a kind of similar learning journey. And as I was going through that learning journey, um, I started developing these principles because I kind of thought, well, I need some guidelines for myself. You know, I, I'm, I'm learning these things. I'm seeing these headlines. People are suggesting different use cases. And I'm kind of thinking, well, what's my guiding thinking? Um, so I have added a bunch of uh, examples to this presentation since I last gave it. Um, so Marie, if I am getting um, off track with time, please do let me know. Um, yeah, so AI is here. Uh, as, as Christy said, the horse is bolted. Um, you're probably using certain AI tools without even knowing it. Um, Recently, you might have noticed that all of the meta products, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, had their search function um, upgraded with Meta's AI. Uh, if you use Siri or Google Assistant or Grammarly, those are all potentially things that could be categorized as AI. And I think using any, a any type of AI for any purpose safely really requires that we do learn this new set of research skills in the same way that, you know, we learn to use a journal database to find academic articles, and then we learn to critique them. We have these critical skills. My presentation is all about the things you need to think about to be, to apply your critical thinking to AI to make smart decisions about using it. So these principles are, are really in flux. I'm developing them. I would love to hear any feedback you have. Um, and yeah, like have a, a really interesting discussion about your thoughts. Um, so as a quick disclaimer, I currently only use AI tools in my personal life with my personal data for my own purposes. I am not speaking on behalf of my employer, purely speaking on behalf of myself. <laughs> So my first principle is remember you are using a machine. Much of the language around AI and, and you know, I, th I thought particularly when Christy shared her slide with all of that kind of, all of the, de the, the buzzwords that have different definitions on, on the screen. Um, a lot of that language is really metaphorical and aspirational. And when, from the perspective of psychology, when we think about what the language we use to describe something, that language influences how we can then think and talk about that thing. So if we call a large language model chatbot artificial intelligence, we might assume that it does other things that are associated with intelligence, like questioning or thinking or knowing. It's not doing those things. Uh, so for me, I like to keep in mind that AI bots only have the training data, the reference data, the model settings, and the prompts that I give it. It doesn't have social context and will not make the assumptions, assumptions that I make. They do not think independently or critically analyze their outputs. They do not know that the real world exists or that their outputs will have consequences or could be testable. They will replicate whatever bias exists in their training and reference data sets. Um, a friend of mine the other day when I was talking to him gave me this great quote. He's very good at giving me great quotes. AI is good at the data, but terrible at metadata. And I feel like uh, Google search AI has just given me a beautiful, beautiful example um, over the weekend. So uh, some of you may have seen on Twitter or um, a variety of news outlets, Google released their search AI function to um, users in the States over the weekend, and it has been a disaster. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized it's giving these silly answers like, you know, spice up your pizza with gasoline or some people, you know, some geologists recommend that you eat a rock per day. You know, the AI is giving those answers because it's reading a Reddit post and not evaluating that post as in terms of the quality of that data and just spitting it out. 
it's reading a satire website like The Onion and not realizing that that is satire and taking it as fact and spitting it out as an answer. So I think that's a really, really good example of the ways that it has the data, it doesn't have the metadata. So this is a, a way that I think is really, really useful to conceptualize AI tools for our purposes when we're thinking about using them. Generalist tasks can be done with generalist tools. Specialist tasks require specialist tools. So generalist tools are most of the tools that we'll be talking about today. They are usually developed with massive amounts of data scraped from the internet. And they're trained with a general goal of just generating human-like output in response to prompts. Yeah. So all of your generative AI, general tool, generalist tool. The specialist tool is much more like, um, I think Chrissy referred to uh, some of the tools that have been developed for use um, in the medical field. Uh, there's one in particular that is exceptionally good at um, interpreting, um, my friend was telling me about it the other day, it was so exciting, uh, is exceptionally good at interpreting x-rays. And those tools are developed using a specific curated data set and trained to complete that specific task and no other. So with a tool like that, you can be sure that you would know the quality of the training data, you know how good that is, you know the values and goals that with which it was trained, and you know the usefulness of the tool for the purpose for which it was created. That's not always the case with generalist tools. In fact, I would say more often than not, it is not the case. And I would say almost all of the tools that we're talking about today, because by definition, the ones that you can get access to on the market will not be in this specialist nuanced space. They'll be these kind of generalist generative tools, a lot of which are based on open AI solutions. So what's an example of a generalist task? What, what would I get a generalist tool to do? Uh, so I love using Copilot. I've been using Copilot for a while now. Uh, and my favorite thing to do with it is to help me get started on a piece of writing so you know when you're stuck and you're like I have to start doing this thing and I hate it and I don't want to do it and you have that kind of motivational hurdle um I will often I often really struggle with that uh when writing emails for things that that kind of stress me out a little bit and so I'll ask Copilot, write me an email to my insurance advisor following up about the information I sent him last week and Copilot will spit out something, and it's usually way, way off the mark, but it's enough that instantly I go, hang on, we can do better than that. And my entire motivation changes, and suddenly I have something to work from. I'm correcting the tool, which has given me something that's not good enough, and I'm not going to send that to my insurance advisor. I need it to be better than that. And suddenly I haven't wasted a bunch of time I've got it done. My next uh, principle is really obvious, but I think it's it's well worth restating and really understanding what this means in the context of AI. Like any other digital tool that we use in evaluation, privacy and security is key. Um, it's especially true if you are thinking about using an AI tool with any kind of confidential evaluation data. Uh, but even if you're not, even if you're using it for a more generalist purpose, um, given how easy it can be to re-identify information and the massive amounts of information that AI stores and refers to, it's still worth being quite careful. Um, so, and it can seem really scary. So it helps to know what questions to ask to, to get yourself thinking. So um, some, some questions that I've kind of developed over the course of learning about AI. Uh, what happens to the prompts and data I input into this tool? Usually, especially with ChatGPT, for example, which you know is, is the ubiquitous example I think that we're all going to regularly harken back to, 
um, that data that you give it, that input becomes part of the model's reference data. And so if someone were then to ask a question of chat GPT that requires your reference data, it'll draw on it. So private and proprietary data definitely shouldn't be something that you input into chat GPT. Uh, so what is the agreement under which I'm using this tool? Am I using a free or a paid version? Paid versions might have different protections. What does it allow the provider of this tool to do with the prompts and input data? Where is my input data stored? Is it stored locally or on a server? If, where is the server located? What privacy legislation exists in that location? What security processes and software are in place both for the company that's providing the tool and for the system I'm working from, whether it's my own personal computer or a work computer or what have you. So obviously using Copilot, before I got started with it, I read through the terms and conditions and the privacy agreement. And one thing I learned is that it doesn't give Microsoft many more permissions than what I've already given them because I use a lot of their other software. Um, but it does allow Microsoft to review the prompts that Copilot identifies as concerning, um, which may or may not be flagged correctly. Um, so for me, that doesn't doesn't really bother me personally because it's me and my personal data. And I'm like, oh, if I ask something and Copilot decides that it's dangerous and a human at Microsoft wants to review it, I don't feel like that's a big deal for me. But on a project scale or an organizational scale, that can become really concerning. Um, I have, and, I, and I'm sure um, that Nick and Christy will know more about this, um, but I know that there are issues of privacy where Microsoft seems to be reviewing a lot more prompts than you would expect. And so that has created privacy issues for that scale. I'm going to do a whistle stop tour through ethics. So definitely it's important to check how your ethics fit into, uh, how AI fits into both your personal ethics and your project ethics. So I'm not going to go into heaps of, of detail because uh, tomorrow there is a presentation that will touch on some of these in, in more detail. And, you know, you could write a thesis on any of these topics, but um, I have listed out a couple of things that I think are really, really important and practical if you're going to use AI. Um, I have changed the format of the slide. All right. Uh, so some things to consider. Uh, most AI decision-making processes are not transparent. Although that is changing, uh, more and more explainable AI tools are being developed. So if you can't get an explanation of how an AI came to a conclusion, what would you be okay using it for? And what would you not be okay using it for? What would you want to look into using an explainable tool that can give you that process information? Um, data theft, all of your, your big popular publicly accessible AI tools were developed using data scraped from the internet without the consent of the people who made that data. This is like the, the biggest, most obvious aspect of this problem is with image generators, uh, which were developed using art stolen from the internet. And do, how do you feel about that? Is that something that you feel comfortable using? Is that something that others in your project feel comfortable using? Uh, both training and using AI, as we've, as a couple of people have pointed out, takes massive amounts of data, uh, power, data and power, both of those things. And it does have a notable impact on global emissions. So uh, emissions from using AI were first calculated last year. So using rather than developing, and they're really surprisingly high. Uh, getting a generative tool to develop an image for you takes as much power as charging your smartphone. Uh, so how does that factor into your ethics? 
especially if your project is already trying to minimize its environmental footprint. Do you want to offset your emissions from using AI? Do you want to be careful about what you use it for and what you don't use it for? Um, and then, of course, you know, there are particular considerations for particular evaluations, like, you know, informed consent. How will you ensure that your participants are giving informed consent for the way that you're using the AI tool? And if you're working with an Indigenous or vulnerable group, what issues of equity or data sovereignty specific to the project may arise in, and can you manage those in some way, or do you want to reconsider your use of the AI tool entirely? I think data sovereignty is one of the key reasons it's really important to consider where the data is stored. Uh, in New Zealand, the Māori data sovereignty movement has really emphasised the importance of not sending Māori data overseas. Um, especially without the knowledge and consent of Māori, obviously. Um, and so it's really important to consider how different groups that you may be evaluating with or who your evaluation may impact might view different aspects of the use of AI. And to do that, you kind of have to understand how these tools are, are made and used and, and what impacts they have. Uh, a number of companies that, that um, provide AI products do have responsible AI principles. Uh, so Microsoft OpenAI, Anthropic, who developed Claude. Um, so it's worth having a read of those and having a critical think about how well they're living up to those principles. Um, I'm just going to quickly flip over this one because it may not be relevant, super relevant for everybody. Um, but do think about copyright and attribution. Um, for the most part, you cannot copyright things that are generated using AI, and which means people can reuse and repurpose them without your permission and without any recourse under copyright law. Uh, I say you generally cannot copyright AI generated content. Uh, there was recently an author that got a very limited copyright for a novel she wrote using AI. Um, and this is likely to shift and change. Um, as Chrissy said, there's watch this space. Um, so if you do need the safety of copyright or the person you're working for wants copyright of the material that you're creating, really think about limiting your use of AI generated content or maybe getting legal advice. Um, if you do want to attribute something generated by AI, um, all of the major reference formats now have ways of doing that. And I, I think David um, is a little bit more familiar with that. Um, find some safe shallows and dip your toe in. Practice, practice, practice prompting. So uh, as um, Christy mentioned, you know, prompt engineering is a thing. And so there are a lot of courses out there and, and other ways to learn to prompt well. Um, but I, I really do recommend practicing with it yourself. Take what you're learning today and tomorrow and, and th throughout the course of Festival. Learn more about the things you're concerned about and, and pick something you feel safe to use. Read the T's and C's, and if you feel okay about them, give it a go. Um, like I pointed out earlier, AI will not make the same assumptions that you make when you're prompting it, which can make prompting AI a really wonderful exercise in examining your own assumptions. Think about what assumptions you're making and try writing them out explicitly in your prompt. No matter what you give it, it will give you an output of some kind, and that output will be authoritative. <laughs> Sometimes that's really funny because you you have these moments of realization where you go, oh, it's not making this assumption that I'm making about it. Um, I had a great example of this the other day. So I recently, while I was working away with Copilot, thought, I wonder if Copilot can can find out this information for me. So I asked it if this particular academic was still employed at the same university. And my assumption was that it would kind of do what I would do in that situation, which is go to the university website, go to LinkedIn, go to other publicly available internet sources like that, 
and find out if that particular individual was still employed at that university. What I got back <laughs> was a high level internet search that referred to three different individuals, none of which was the person I was asking about. They, but they had really similar names. And I realized, of course, Copilot doesn't know that this word and this word refers to a person who exists in the real world and that you can't simply substitute Laurie or Crawford with different words and still be referring to the same thing. So um, that was a learning curve for me. I really needed to examine my assumptions a bit more and really think about, was it worth getting Copilot to do that when I could have Google searched it myself? Probably not. Um, and so in that way, I, th I do think uh, learning to prompt AI can, can be a fun exercise, especially from an evaluation perspective of just examining your own, your own assumptions. Um, the other thing to try is using iterative prompts to improve on the output you've already got. So often, you know, Copilot will give me something and I'll go, uh, make it less excited and American sounding. <laughs> and it'll come back to me with something a bit more my tone. <laughs> um, and and it'll, it'll kind of update the output that it, I've already given it. Don't be afraid to use your everyday language because they're called natural language models because that's how they were trained. So they they do have that everyday speak kind of data. Uh, to err is no longer human. To err is AI. Um, if you ask it something, it will give you something, a very authoritative something, even if it's completely wrong. Whatever you do with AI, check it. You can reduce hallucinations to a some extent by improving how you prompt the tool. Uh, and David has some great examples of this that I, I think he'll cover shortly. But the training and reference databases, which we often don't have control over, are, are also sources of error, which we can see from the, the Google example. So uh, ask it to include references if it hasn't already done so. Follow up those references to make sure that they actually exist and that they back up the claims being made. I've heard of examples where those, neither of those have been the case. And examine the generated content for mistakes and bias and other issues. Um, so this is my last slide. Good timing. <laughs> make AI work for your workflow. Once you've got your head around it, there's no point in just using AI for the sake of using AI. Uh, as we've established, it has a variety of issues around it and we need to take those into account. Um, you should be able to use it in a way that delivers the exciting promised efficiencies for you without ending up on the front page of a newspaper. Figure out what tasks your workflow can use in your workflow can be usefully completed by, by AI and use it for those. Um, a good analogy is to use it like a personal assistant. Get it to do those kind of idea generate or grindy writing tasks or drafting tasks. And through a process of trial and error, using your knowledge and evaluative thinking, you can make sure that AI works for you. What Think about things like what tasks do you personally struggle with or dislike? What AI tools are integrated with software you already use? Are they useful to you? Can they make things smoother by being integrated? I've recently signed up to trial Copilot Pro, which is integrated with all of the Office software. And I have found it very useful so far, integrated with my email. I hate writing emails and it's a great productivity tool because I'm much less likely to sit there going, oh, I don't want to write this email to my insurance advisor. Are you, if you're spending more time correcting the AI than you would doing the work, do you need to learn to prompt it better? Do you need a different approach? Do you need a different tool? Or is that just not a task suited to AI? Uh, there are also a 
huge number of uh, what I've come to refer to as bolt-on programs that people have developed to use with ChatGPT. My favorite is one called Goblin Tools. And you can do things like brain dump into it and it will give you a to-do list. And you didn't have to write the rest of that prompt. You just brain dumped and it goes, here's your to-do list. And it's really helpful. But Marie is signaling me that I should let you guys ask some questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that presentation, Laurie. That was a fantastic um, summary of the principles and the practical points that we should all be aware of um, when we use AI. Due to time constraints, we will take questions for both speakers at the end. There are, there are two questions here in the chat and they keep coming. Um, I will hand over to David um, as we only have we only have 20 minutes. David, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Marie, for pulling this together. I really appreciate it. Laurie, excellent points. I'll be building on yours. And Christy, I want to also thank you uh, for helping to pull this together as far as it really fits in beautifully with, I think, all of our presentations. So thank you also. Let me go right to the slides, if you give me a second. And uh, we'll, as I say, just build on what we've just, uh, just uh, heard. Can you see my slide right now? I'm going to do this. Can you see the curtains open? Thumbs up? Okay. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to make sure everything's good. I'll be building, as I said, on what you've just heard. Uh, and I think uh, very powerfully with just some very pragmatic uh, examples as we go through, but building on the conceptual at the same time. Uh, we're all trying to figure this out together. So uh, bear with all of us since uh, we can add what we even have insights on. You are also learning at the same time. I, I think the basic message uh, and the giveaway before I even start is just do it, play with it. That's the only way you're gonna be able to understand the dynamics of what it does well, what it does poorly, for you. So I think I just my giveaway before we even start. When I first presented this at the American Evaluation Association, we thought it was a few nerds that might be interested and it would be very uh, just a you know very tiny group. And instead, as you can see, it was overwhelming. People, you can see Tom right there, he's a former past president of the American Evaluation Association and other past presidents there. It was into the hallways sitting on the floor, we had no idea it was going to be that big. So as a consequence, we promised each other that we'd still build on this and not wait for the next meeting. So we created a LinkedIn, which of course, feel free to join in with us. It's free. It's just, you know, open to all of us called AI and evaluation. Find it on LinkedIn. And if you have something you're learning, post it up there. We're all doing that together. You've probably seen the issue that came out in evaluation and artificial intelligence. Anyway, we've done a lot to keep on building on it with panels publications and posts. And in fact, my son and I have just have uh, been asked to do a chapter. So we have one forthcoming uh, on artificial intelligence and evaluation and Axel Keenan and uh, Julie Feathers book, Handbook of Health Services Evaluation, Theories, Methods and Innovative Practices, Springer Publishing. It's in press forthcoming. And, you know, it's just one more area where we're just trying to share what we're learning. That's all this is uh, for all of us. This is a very interesting example that highlights part of what you've already heard, I think, already. I was going to give a you know, brief history of uh, this process, and I could talk about the early 50s and when that was, they created checker games that you could actually not tell as a computer. And then you get later into the 60s and further on, you can do a chess. And nowadays, you know, you have um, driverless cars, you have facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera. But when you ask the question about the history of valuation, you come up with names like Alan, right? John, Marvin, Herbert, all these folks that you know. But you know what you notice? They're not all, but like 90% guys, men. That's not wrong. It happens to be pretty accurate. But when you ask then women who have made significant contributions, and that is what you do have to ask, then you get answers that are like uh, from different places, MIT, Cornell, Berkeley, et cetera. The, my point is, and you've already heard it, there are built-in biases, as you already know. And by the way, I'm for AI and everything else, but I'm very keenly aware, as you, and as you've heard from Christy and Lori, there are problems that we have to sort of pinpoint. And the more you play with it, you'll see 
Just go with your gut. There's something not right. Ask it more precisely. Like, who are the women who have made these contributions? Now, should you have to ask that? It's a shame you have to, but you do, and you need to be more precise in general in all of our prompts because they're built-in biases. Now, you all have heard a lot of alphabet soup. Uh, Christy did a very good job highlighting all them. I'm just going to point out the relationships because we hear this and we get so confused. And, you know, I did too. So I just try to put it together in one slide to get some sort of relationship for organization. So if you think of artificial intelligence, it teaches computers to think, learn, and make decisions. Well, machine learning is a subset of AI, enabling computers to learn from and make predictions. You feel a lot of information into it and it recognizes a cat on its own. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. It learns from large amounts of unlabeled data, multi-level computer brain. It breaks through things things down into it makes to solve problems. You've heard about the neural networks, interconnected nodes that process information with weights for each neuron. It does, you know, a small job, recognizes shapes uh, together to recognize a face. And you have large language models. You've already heard that today, but it's a type of deep learning. I'm just trying to give you some context and you know. Just personally, and as an evaluator, I just like to have some organization for this sort of thing. Anyway, that's trained on vast amounts of text data, et cetera, and it can generate human-like text like GPT. Artificial intelligence, one level. Another level is data science to uncover the hidden patterns and predict future trends. I just wanted to share this with you just as a way to help you conceptualize this. Since you hear, I'm sure, this alphabet soup all the time, it's nice to have some sense of order of how it works mm -hmm. together. This is the fundamental part of how large language uh, models really work. It's just mathematical probabilities. It's just what's the next letter? What's the next word? What's the next pair? When you say United States of, you don't say pizza, United States of America. That's all this is. We make it so complex. It's not that complex. Yes, it's multi-level. It's billions of pieces of data. That's complex. But the principles behind it are really probabilities. Let me give you a little bit more on how, in a sense, simple this is and obviously complex when you add tremendous amounts of data. I happen to like uh, Earl Grey uh, tea, so I use that as an example. The input, it's an A, you're creating a B. It's a binary kind of process. My favorite drink, guess what? It predicts is. My favorite drink is, guess what? Earl. My favorite drink is Earl Grey. My favorite drink is Earl Grey tea. Basically, when you train large AI systems on a lot of data, you get a large language model. And it predicts the most likely letter, word, paragraph, et cetera, et cetera. That's, it's just, that's the way this process works, just to bring it down to something very realistic in terms of when you think about what the basic elements of large language models do. This is when you get to deep learning. Same basic principle, but if you're like a real estate person or something, you know, uh, you'd want to have the square footage. You'd have the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms renovated or not renovated. Uh, and you take that A, and to get to B, you change the square footage. You change how three bedrooms to four bedrooms, and you interact with each of the different nodes to come out with the price. So it's a subset of machine learning, as I said before. Learns from a large amount of unlabeled data. Multi-level, see how many different levels when you change each of the variables. Uh, it breaks things down to solve problems, and that's the neural network. When you're thinking about that gobbledygook in the middle, that's what that is. Now, one of the things you've sort of heard, I think, through Christy to some degree, and certainly Lori has highlighted, is that it's really pretty darn reliable. It creates really good patterns. It just might not always be accurate. Uh, and we are aimed at validity, obviously, as uh, uh, evaluators. And we want to get accuracy as much as we can. So we do have to put a check on it. It can be powerfully reliable, but the problem is it could be like a bad formula in an Excel spreadsheet. It just goes forever is a problem, uh, multiplying problems. And that includes biases that we do not want. Applications. Let's just jump to some of those for a minute. It can analyze documents, as you've heard, and pictures. It can draw pictures, outline class lessons and objectives, summarize articles, which is kind of nice. And you just heard Lori about writing letters or emails, et cetera, blogs. You might change it, you might not like it, but it'll write it for you beautifully. And as you can, you probably already know, it can do it as a scholar, it can do it as a marketer, change the sort of the temperature as it were. 
I'm very much, as you probably already know, involved in a lot of medical evaluation as well as uh, uh, educational. Uh, that's my retina, by the way, in the middle. And the data is that um, AI has become more precise in the medical area than seasons ophthalmologists. That's the retinal scan in the center. Gastroenterologists, uh, radiologists, et cetera, with the x-rays. If you want to see more, look at a TED Talk uh, by Eric Topol. I really thought it was very impressive on the data and the ability to identify polyps, for example, uh, to identify uh, cancer, uh, obviously diabetes and things of that nature. Phenomenal. And we've only begun. I'm only talking about like a couple hundred thousand images in, in, uh, in the case of uh, certain uh, x-rays. And we're not even at the billion level or anything of that nature for these. So can you imagine how much more powerful this is going to become in an incredibly short period of time? Problems, attribution. We are in the wild west mode still uh, for a source of data. We have bias that's phenomenal <laughs> in a negative way for gender, race, socioeconomics. Confidentiality is a problem, proprietary information built into the learning system. You know, you've heard just what Christy mentioned, what Laurie mentioned. Employment could be job loss. We'll talk about job increasing, of course, to new, new jobs. Hallucinations, and I want to highlight this one a little bit more. You've heard a little bit about it. I want to just give a little bit more, as Laurie alluded to, where it's stretching knowledge. And then we have equity uh, and the AI gap in the big tech and the democratization. By the way, I should go back and most of these images by the way, I've generated using Dolly 3 and other uh, image creators. Hallucination is very important. When you ask, and this was a very big deal in the New York Times and other areas, but I, wanted, I want to see all the sides of the moon. Well, if that's what you're asking AI, it will do it, even though we don't have pictures of all different sides of the moon. Basically, it interpolates. It is filling the gaps for where it would probably look like this based on these two or three or four or five images, it's telling you what you want to hear. So it's not malicious. It's not lying to you. It's not that station, you know, kind of idea of it's out there thinking about how it's going to get you and mislead you. It's giving you what you want. That is what AI does. And that's a really good, I think, explanation of what hallucinations really are rather than this you know, fearful machine taking over the universe type of thing. I, I hope that's helpful to really put hallucinations in perspective. They're not great to have, but they are what we're asking. It just means sometimes we're not asking the right questions in the right way or checking them. Basically, we have to pierce the AI veil. There are many false positives and false the assumptions. And a lot of predictive policing, for example, uh, it'll be based on the data that they have of folks arrested. So the question then, is it really asking who is it likely who is likely to be arrested versus who is likely to commit a crime? See the difference? And that's powerful. In addition, you have facial recognition software that has a lot of distortions, particularly with minorities uh, around the world, high error rate. You can look at the spot shotter example uh, later, but it really deals with the individual who's put into jail for almost a year because of this uh, error in facial recognition. Um, the idea is we have to start thinking carefully and be evaluators for what exactly is behind the scenes. And we'll get to that. I created my own GPT, not just for fun, but so I had a better understanding of how does the sausage get put together? And I have a better feel so I can then put a check on things uh, much, much better than I would have otherwise. But we'll get to that uh, shortly. This is fundamental to, I think, all of our presentations, so I want to highlight this. And that is the concept of AI, it's called AI misalignment, it's just to get familiar with the language people are using these days, with our social values. We believe in being, life, hopefully, being fair, equitable, and a democratic society. This image I created, this one was using Dolly 3, it contrasts the efficient management of resources and technology and all that sort of thing with compromises in social values such as privacy invasion, job displacement, biased decision-making. It captures the tension between the technological advances and these social, societal concerns. The answer, and there is an answer, is not to be just, oh, no, we should not use this because of all these problems. It means we need to invite stakeholders with domain-specific expertise at the table. If you're a member of a specific ethnic group, socioeconomic class, Whatever it might be, you need to be at the table. 
You have to be part of this. That's why it's important for all of us not to walk away from this with all its problems. It's to jump in and be a part of this, understand the dynamic, understand why it produces what it produces, and to be in there in that process. That's the only way we will fundamentally be able to work away at the AI misalignment that does exist already because it simply reproduces the status quo. Interim solutions, and there are plenty, uh, they range from attribution and uh, accuracy. Now I'm using Copilot as well as Lori, and guess what? It automatically is now giving us the references and footnotes. Of course, you check on it, of course, but before it didn't give anything or gave false ones. They're listening to what we're saying by providing the feedback, and we should provide feedback uh, when we produce our work. Pro proprietary information, there wasn't any way of really protecting it earlier. Now we have enterprise accounts. Uh, we have personalized language models that you can do for less than $200, by the way, and create your own data set. And that's sort of what I did with the GPT I created, and I'll show you that and how simple it is for all of us to do if we want to. Bias, racial equity lens, Trust your gut first. Something doesn't feel right. It's probably something wrong. But then search for bias, report it. You use a vetted database. You can create a date, your own database. So it's not, uh, and, then, and not just used in the medical area, of course, where we use that, but in your own area in evaluation. The alignment problem I talked about specifically is really getting domain specific expertise at the table. Look at this just as an example. This is a self correction example over here. And this is basically using just Copilot. I asked it about APIs and some other stuff. And it gives me all of the references that I got the information from. It gives me the footnotes to go back to it. So I, of course, check on it, but it's amazingly accurate. And it was amazingly uh, inaccurate when you first looked at BARD, for example, and some of the other, uh, which now, of course, Gemini, but uh, many of the other initial uh, uh, tools that we had out there. Anyway. It's now providing references automatically. It's providing additional web references, footnotes, et cetera, it, reducing barriers. It's reducing hate speech. We'll go into why that's obviously uh, part of this process. Obviously, I won't go into all the detail now, and I just thought you'd get a kick out of this. I presented this to the American Evaluation Association earlier, and just this week to the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, I'm helping them as well. Uh, and this is cute because I, I highlighted the obvious, chat GPT 3.5, it's free but the data goes to only 2022. Uh, ChatGPT 4 and ChatGPT 4.0 is the latest one. The 4 is $20 a month. The O is free at the moment. Um, and then I, I mentioned um, Claude, of course, a hidden long text and attaches documents and stuff. It's, it's pretty powerful, very nice. And I'll tell you why I like Claude a lot later. Um, I'll highlight that it has a constitution, which I'll go into why that's important. It's four principles. Gemini was funny because when I first introduced it one week at the American Evaluation Association, I said 80% of what I have to say is going to be accurate and still useful for at least four to five, maybe six months. Um, and the rest, I can't promise. The next week, it went from BARD to changes to Gemini that quick in that one week. So it's cute how fast things are changing in many respects. I also happen to prefer Pilot, um, Microsoft Copilot AI. Because you get ChatGPT 4 and Dolly 3 for free. Why pay the 20 bucks for ChatGPT? And it's funny, people are still paying the $20, even though you can get it through uh, Copilot. And the Pro, as you mentioned, Lori, earlier, you can also integrate more, more fully. Now, technically, Gemini should be the best because it has access to all the Google stuff. And for some reason, it's still in the bottom. It just can't get its act together yet. But it has the potential to be number one beyond all of them because it can integrate with everything. It's just not there at the moment. This is Dolly 3 that you've heard about. I do a lot of work in tobacco prevention, keeping minority kids away from tobacco, using empowerment evaluation, helping communities learn how to evaluate their own programs. And this has created a nice, powerful image uh, that was cool about, I happen to, it happens to be a worldwide problem uh, in terms of tobacco uh, use and consumption and how it's targeted at minority uh, youth in particular. Um, and I wanted to have a nice impact. So I came up with a globe, described it carefully with cigarettes in it to show it's a global impact, not just a, a local one. Anyway, just used image. It's a nice impact and tool. And you can check to see in some cases if it's stealing from it, where it got it from. Some cases you cannot. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit more as we go through. 
You can also use not just Dolly 3, but Crea and many other ones if you want more realistic looking images. There's not just one tool out there and they all have different approaches in terms of what they can produce. Draw a six year old professor with white hair and a white beard writing his new book. That's how precise you need to be. Oh, is that me? That's like, you know, but how precise do you need to be when you do prompts? You wanna get very careful and concrete. I do a lot of work uh, in right now. I'm going back, I'm going to India. I think it's next month. Uh, so I'll try to respond to any questions before I go. If you have additional ones that you don't get to today, you can email me, but I'll be a little bit delayed in getting back to you because I have to do some work over there. But look at this. It highlights, uh, this is some images I was trying to get across uh, when we're working remotely, how you have to be careful in your prompts. And I'll show you my mistakes. I can't show you them all. We don't have a lot of time, but I'll show you as much as I can. In the first prompt, I said, a picture of a hypodermic needle eliminating tuberculosis. And look at it, it's a needle into the thumb. Oh, that's not gonna sell to anybody, right? That's my first mistake. So I had to learn to be a little bit more careful in my prompting. A hypodermic needle eliminating lung disease in rural India. Well, that's closer, but my gosh, I'm gonna scare the heck out of the kids if you have a hypodermic needle going into a lung like that. The third prompt, a hypodermic needle in a person's arm to eliminate lung disease in rural India. See how amazingly precise I had to get to, get to something that's close to working. And that one's okay in the bottom. My only point is to show you, sometimes this is gonna take you longer than you think. It's gonna actually be more labor intensive, not actually more efficient to get what you want. But in this case, it's worth taking the extra time it's like Google, you get better at Google if you, you know, use it over and over. Same thing with this, you learn to be more precise in terms of what it can produce. Iterative prompts, applications and evaluation. Well, I not only use it for myself to do logic models for tobacco prevention programs, but since I do a lot of empowerment evaluation, helping them learn how to do evaluation themselves, I help them use this and then I can be a coach or a friend to see if they miss something or how to interpret some aspect, but they can learn how to do this. So I can sort of work myself out of the job, not a popular idea, but it's actually important to do to help other people take control of their lives as much as you can. But look at how simple it is. It had the research, it had the community outreach. It did a beautiful job on things. Actually, I can forget sometimes one of the key activities in a logic model it's, that I've been doing for like a couple of decades, I can still forget and it doesn't. So logic models is one use. Another one, theory of change. You know, it's hard to remember all the possibilities, but this comes up with most of them like that. Theory of planned behavior, changes in trans theoretical model. It goes on and on. It's got like all these cool theories and you find out which is the probably the most best match. And then of course, tinker to make sure it's tailored to the right program. Other ones, it can produce beautiful interview questions really pretty well. You know, for empowerment evaluations, what are your goals? What do you think the program, why do you think, how do you think the program is working? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? It's all obvious stuff. And, and, and tips, create a safe and supportive environment. Use open-ended questions, listen. I mean, this is beautiful. And sometimes it does a better job than I do sometimes at remembering all the key parts of it. So it's a nice check. And this is just happening using Gemini, so you know what I'm doing. I love this, by the way. And this is going to save time. Thank you. You can use it for data analysis. I use this and it takes large data sets like Kegel, which are free. And guess what? Interpret this data. Uh, and when you have all the aspects understood, say I'm ready, blah, blah, blah. The data has been cleaned, which takes me usually a couple days, 30 seconds. There are no remaining duplicates. And I hate doing that part. And it can clean it all up and give you the bar graph. It can come with these box graph, anything to give you the, the information. It tells you how to break it down. It's phenomenal in about three minutes or sometimes less versus three days. I'm gonna end with creating my own GPT. I created one, you can create your own, the GPT creator or GPT builder. I'm gonna just quickly, oops, quickly go through that so you have a feel for how to do that. One second, there we go. It's showing the actual GPT over here. This is what it looks like and you can ask any question. Uh, there, any videos like this of empowerment, say, power, I'm sorry, and evaluation, boom. And guess what? Yes, there's several videos available, brief videos describing it. I have an Ignite lecture. I have an NSF funded one, COVID one. I have another one the way they interviewed me. 
I have a TED talk I gave. Uh, you can say watch on, on YouTube over here. Click on that. And it brings you to the YouTube. With PIAA, you can get guaranteed growth in any one. It goes through this commercial like you always see you in any kind of YouTube thing. And then when it's done, with the dignity they'll bring you right to, to the, uh, the page you really want. You still have to deal with, with commercials. The best prayer to attract wealth begins when you understand three, that two, the strongest one, energy in the universe one more. is not thought. And boom. Comes up with the TED talk I gave. I know how I write it. I won't go through all of it. I'm going to talk about empowerment, evaluation, searching first. That's how quickly it can come up with what you're looking for. Phenomenal. And I created this. It didn't take any time at all to help create the, the process. It's going to just do, I guess, a loop over here. So let me just drop back over here real quickly. And like so. And let me just end with, if you want to learn more about how to do it, it's simple in terms of just creating. It just says, I want to generate instructions. It creates instructions. It gives you names that you can call it. It can come up with visuals for you as to what you want it to look like. When it didn't have some information I wanted, I just put up a Word document into it to then have it source the information. That's how you vet it, so you can control the data rather than just anything. I'll stop so you have a feel for how this works. Uh, but as I said, I just uploaded this information and it was able to handle it. I just wanna make sure you know, things like text to video is coming up with OpenAI, Sora. You can have text, it'll create videos for you. And as Lori mentioned, I also look at citations. Look at Ask Google or search, uh, sorry, ChatGPT. What are the way of doing citation? It'll tell you MLA, APA, et cetera. Let me end with the fact that constitutions are important. Uh, what do you call it? Claude is the one that has the primary one, which is to create safe, ethical, aligned human values. Doesn't mean it's always going to do it, but if it's more likely to, that has a part of its constitution. Google's AI has principles. Uh, ChatGPT has guided uh, uh, principles inside it, but Claude is explicit. Look for that when you're looking for these things. I'll stop now. If you need to contact me, email me if uh, we don't have time for all of your questions, and uh, I'm happy to respond. It might take me a couple more days than usual because I'll be traveling. But other than that, let me stop and thank you for staying long enough to hear how we all are working together, building on our ideas. Thanks.